A lonesome group of trembling aspen stands in the middle of a clear cut. A year ago, these were surrounded by its young, but they were cut down, leaving this grove to eventually move on with none to take its place. The mixed forest that once stood here, like what you see behind it, is in the process of being replaced with a plantation of pine trees. While this meets the criteria of sustainable forest management, this forest has suffered an incredible loss. The aspen is one of the most important trees that we have in North America. By virtue of the food and habitat it provides, the aspen supports an astounding array of wildlife. Thanks to its unique properties, it can keep landscapes cool, waters flowing, all the while sequestering record-breaking amounts of carbon dioxide and holding wildfires at bay. The aspen can provide enormous benefits to our society and our environment, but we can't reap these benefits if we keep eliminating them. So I grew up in a small community in the central interior of British Columbia called Punchau. And as I grew up, these trees grew up as well, prolifically. It always amazed me how quick these trees grew. I'm sure it amazes a lot of foresters too, but not in the same good way. Along with the cottonwood, the aspen grows the most amount of woody tissue of any plant in the least amount of time in our forests. They also seem to spring out of nowhere, perhaps from one of the tiny, countless seeds that they send forth every year. But the aspen rarely reproduces from seed. More typically, it grows from this amazing underground root system that can spread for many acres and can be thousands of years old. This is one of the first things we should really value about aspen, and that's the stability provided by this root system. Not only physically, as these roots are thought to hold soil together, which can reduce erosion and blow down, but also in the ecological sense of providing continuity. As long as we don't interfere with this root system, it can survive catastrophic disturbances, climatic disruptions, as a sort of subterranean seed bank. It can maintain a specific ecosystem on a site for hundreds of thousands of years. Like this forest in Fish Lake, Utah. It has a name, it's called Pando. And every tree that you see here is genetically identical and grows from a single aspen root mass. You'd call this group of trees a clone, and usually they're a lot smaller, and you can identify them yourself this time of year in autumn by seeing the differences in time when they turn yellow or lose their leaves. Some may lose their leaves a week earlier than the group beside it. So you can tell that these two groups are genetically distinct clones. So Pando is the largest clone yet identified. It's about 43 hectares, or 106 acres. And it's estimated to be between 50 and 80,000 years old. So this makes a lowly old aspen forest the oldest and largest organism on the planet. So when you look up at a hillside and you see a group of aspen trees, it's not just a mere group of trees. You're seeing the terrestrial existence of this ancient underground organism recharging its root system while it can, before it gets replaced by conifers. That's how this root system survives. It's one of the first trees to grow back after disturbance like logging or fire because it's been there all along. It's not invasive and it's not a weed and it's not some kind of unexpected shift in the forest type. The boreal forest, inner interior forest, is a fluid, dynamic place. And these different forest types, they trade places with each other. Over time, the conifers will outcompete the aspens. A disturbance will occur, and the cycle continues. This is called the ongoing cycle of secession in our forests. I call this stage of the forest the unwanted forest because the standard practice is to eliminate these species as rapidly as possible and return it once again to conifer trees. Different ways to do this, but a common way around here is through aerial applications of herbicide to kill the aspens. And this is making our forests hotter, it's making them drier, it's making them more flammable, and it's making them less biodiverse. We are maladapting our forests to the very climatic and biodiversity challenges that lie ahead. So I consider myself lucky to have grown up amongst the aspen. I've watched the various animals that thrive in these ecosystems, the moose, the deer, the bears, songbirds, woodpeckers, and even domesticated cattle. The association between aspen and wildlife is apparently universal all across North America. Important game birds like rough grouse are statistically linked to the presence of aspen forests as far away as Wisconsin. 
Rosamund Pojar discovered that the aspen forests in her study area in Eskina region had 225% higher bird densities than the pine monoculture in her study area. The highest ungulate densities that I've seen recorded in Western Canada are in Elk Island National Park east of Edmonton. And that forest is 97% aspen. The richness of this fauna and these aspen forests is a very basic product of the forest's architecture, and this has to do with the inherent efficiency of aspen trees. As I mentioned, they grow the most amount of woody tissue in the least amount of time of any tree in our forest, but even so, they don't shade out all the light. Due to various adaptations like photosynthetic bark, which does actually a very large share of the tree's overall photosynthetic legwork, and the trembling leaves, which are thought to turbocharge photosynthesis, the aspen tree makes do with less. Much more light is able to filter through a mature aspen canopy relative to that of a mature conifer canopy. This creates the conditions for a rich, multi-layered understory of plants. Studies from across Western Canada have shown this understory plant community can support between 200 and 300 percent more ruminants. It's not only this understory plant community that's a great provider of food in our forest. The tree itself, from its photosynthetic bark, which is rich in carbohydrates, to the nutritious buds that form in the fall, only to burst forth in appetizing leaf in the spring, the tree is a literal food basket. So Dr. Roy Ray at the University of Northern British Columbia discovered that moose preferred aspen bark for their winter food above all other species in the study area, including willow and red osier dogwood, and the latter of which is long being considered the favorite food of moose. Pando, the old aspen forest in Utah, is suffering because the deer and elk are eating every last little young aspen shoot. Cattle will do the same thing. Bears will climb into the tops of aspen trees in the spring to eat the buds, and beaver will eat aspen year-round. The relationship between beaver and aspen is really important, and aspen is considered the highest quality beaver habitat available, not only for food, but for building stuff. Speaking of building things, birds also love aspen to make their cavity nests. Kathy Martin from the University of British Columbia discovered that 95% of all cavity nests were in aspen trees, even though the aspen trees were only a small part of the forest, 15%. So when we hear news about the global declines in biodiversity, we really need to check out our own record on this issue. We have rules and regulations that legally require the exclusion of aspen forests from participating in the regeneration of our forests. By suppressing these species, we threaten the long-term viability of this root system. The potential loss of these trees threatens the habitat of iconic Canadian animals, from moose to beaver to grouse and many in between. So if our goal is to enhance the richness of life in our forests, then we really need to advocate for the aspen. We share a responsibility to reverse this global decline. We also share a responsibility to help make our forests the best fighters of climate change that they can be. So aspen trees sequester more carbon, they can stop more wildfires, and they have a couple of other really cool features that make them essential in this regard. So one of them is the fact that aspen trees aren't as dark-toned as conifer trees. And as we all know, a darker object in the sun will be hotter to the touch than something that's lighter. In studies across the boreal forest, we've discovered that aspen trees reflect 80% more sunlight than conifer trees in the summertime. And in wintertime, they'll reflect about 60% more sunlight. So that means every time that we get rid of aspen trees, we're making our planets, or sorry, our landscape and our planet into that much bigger of a heat sink. While aspen are reflecting heat and solar radiation, they're attracting moisture and water. This is most apparent in wintertime. And if you go hiking through an aspen forest, you'll notice that the snow is a lot deeper in the aspen forest than in the conifer forest. Not having leaves, much more Precipitation and snowfall is able to accumulate on the forest floor, whereas in a conifer forest, much more of it gets hung up on the needles, where it then evaporates, sublimates, rather, or blown away. So in studies done, we've discovered that aspen forests will allow almost over three times as much snowfall to develop on the forest floor. So this really helps recharge the moisture heading into summertime. And even in summertime, the aspen allows more moisture to the forest floor. And the soil in aspen forests, being higher microfungi, having more organic material, 
lower acidity and higher nitrogen is a more effective sponge and holds on to more water for longer. This is apparently true of deciduous forests in general throughout the Northern Hemisphere. In his wonderful book, The Hidden Life of Trees, Peter Wohlleben talks about this with respect to beech forests in Germany and how much more moisture they maintain compared to the spruce plantations in his study area. In a study carried out in the Appalachian Mountains, when they replaced a deciduous forest with a white pine plantation, the stream flows declined by 20%. So if we can expect to have more droughts in the future or more uncertain weather patterns, having more deciduous on our landscape can help maintain stream flows. And this can assist migrating salmon and other creatures of our watersheds. They don't do this only directly through those methods I've just identified, but also indirectly through supporting beaver whose water-conserving dams Aspen are often responsible for. You'll often hear Aspen criticized for taking over the wet, fertile areas of the forest, but in many respects, this is unfair. It's not so much that they're taking these sites over, it's that they've created them and they're maintaining them. Ron Ignis of the Skeeches and Indian Band recently said that the Aspen and the Birches are the irrigators of the mountains, and that's exactly what they are. So this all ties into why the aspen tree is so much more effective at withstanding wildfire than the tree, the forest types that we replace them with. So gathering more moisture throughout the year and having more water content in the, the tree's tissue and not having flammable resins, the aspens are much more difficult to light on fire. In the old days, trappers would know this, and they would, if they had the opportunity and the wisdom, they'd build their cabin in an aspen stand, knowing that in the event of a wildfire, they wouldn't get burnt out. But this is now backed up empirically. Over a 36-year period, Dr. Steve Cumming discovered that pine forests burnt 840% more than aspen forests in northern Alberta, and black spruce was even more flammable. So to put that in a different metric, for every 100 units of pine that you lose to fire, you'd only lose 12 units of aspen, assuming they're equally distributed on the landscape. This ties into why Aspen are so much more effective at sequestering carbon. Not only can they stabilize this carbon that all forests sequester in the face of wildfire by reducing wildfire, but they can also sequester more carbon just by nature of their sheer efficiency and rapid growth. Summarizing forest carbon sequestration studies from across North America, an article in the Forest Ecology and Management Journal notes that the highest living and above-ground carbon stocks were always observed in single-species aspen stands. In all the literature that I've reviewed, the only ecosystem in our forests that is more efficient and better at storing carbon are peat bog systems. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this forest unwanted? Why are we excluding this forest from participating in this cycle that's been going on for millions of years? They support so much life. They can reduce forest fires, they can sequester more carbon. They're just the tree that we need at this point in time. So on what basis are they considered a problem? And the answer is that these trees are assumed not to have any commercial value. That because they don't make a useful wood product, they don't belong in our forests. And this is a huge mistake, not only for the reasons I just outlined, but because the aspen is actually a very versatile and wonderful wood. For 40 years, since the first industrial facility in Canada utilized aspen, aspen has been used in an enormous array of products. From OSB panel used in sheathing, to integrated truss choice systems, to parallel beams, to finished grade plywood. Aspen has desirable and actually lower shrinkage rates, uh, higher resistance to impact bending, and comparable strength to weight ratios as your standard softwoods. Let's not forget it looks fabulous as a wall panel product or in furniture. So the challenge we face is how do we bring our economic model back in line with our forests? Simplifying our stand structures and our ecology to match the lack of diversity in our wood product sector is making our forests more vulnerable to fire, to pests, and to failure. It undermines other activities and livelihoods and industries that depend on the productivity provided by Aspen. So that would include cattle ranching, trapping, guide outfitting, hunting and gathering, not to mention tourism. So that's the one challenge. And the other challenge is for us as Canadians to 
turn our gaze to the aspen a little more closely. The aspen is one of our... So if we lose these trees, we don't only lose an incredible amount of biological productivity, resiliency, and a tool we may find useful down the road. We'll also lose a cultural icon of the north. These trees can't be called and wanted anymore, and I'd say we need them. Thanks. Not only is it amazing and awesome, but it represents all of Canada, from coast to coast and from the southern border all the way up to as far as where trees will grow. It's the tree type that is the best able to support our quintessential Canadian animals, the beaver and the moose.